what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. All right, Matthew Iglesias, great to have you here on the Learning Leader Show. Welcome, man. Really glad to be here. How's it going? Uh, it's good. It's good. Uh, you, yeah. mentioned, you, you mentioned that uh, you guys are, are, uh, haven't chosen to be, but have found yourself uh, to be homeschool teachers, <laughs> like most of us. How's yeah. it going for you and your wife? Uh, you know, I mean, it's really her who is mostly doing this, but we she's taken on a, a bunch of kids uh, from my son's kindergarten class. We've got a good, you know, it's a diverse group, some people contributing financially, some people who, who need help with that. Um, you know, it's... It's difficult, obviously, um, but you know, we're making do. So it's kindergartners. So I would imagine your area of expertise, are you not brought in as a guest <laughs> speaker or teacher at all? Or is it too high, high up for them? I think my, my main uh, contribution is like reaching things on high shelves and uh, occasionally You're the manual labor, labor heavy, guy. heavy bottles of water. Yeah. So Love it. Someday, someday maybe I can, I can teach the kids to blog, but I think that might be more of like a high school course. All right. Well, I, I want to, I'm going to hit on that uh, during our talk today, but Matthew, so just so you know, um, I was I was reading One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger, which is your latest book. And I actually typically turn to the back first to look for the acknowledgement section. And the, and the copy I got, I uh, got an early copy uh, there, that isn't in there yet. However, I did read the epilogue first and I wanted to start from the back. Uh, and maybe we'll tweak this up and then learn more about you and your story. And that is, you wrote about the JFK speech and I'm going to read part of that. I mean, most people have heard it, obviously, but I, but I think it's important for me to actually say the words and then to ask you why you chose to use that example. And the words are, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, one which we intend to win. Why was that particular speech and that moment of the speech important enough for you to put in your in your latest book? Okay, so, you know, the book is called One Billion Americans. The, the argument is that we should aim for substantial population growth, tripling 1 billion people. You know, and question is why, right? So at the introduction, you read it's like China, international competition, et cetera. But that JFK speech, you know, it's, it's inspirational to me thinking about the United States of America, but thinking about organizations in general, right? If you set goals for yourself, ambitious goals, but achievable goals, and you try really hard to work at them, it has a disciplining function, right? It inspires everybody to do their best. It also lets you benchmark, like, are we achieving our goals? Do we need to course correct? Do we need to do something? And it strikes me, you know, I, I cover day-to-day -day politics. I, I do a lot of stuff. Uh, but one of the striking things about the United States of America over the past five, 10, 15 years is that I don't think we have strong goals, right? I mean, of course we disagree, but it's silly to say, oh, the problem with our politics is we disagree. Like that's what politics is for, to have debates. But when you have some kind of high level objectives, then those debates are about something and you can reach compromises around disagreements or maybe one side will win and they'll take turns, but you're trying to do something. Right now, we're in a moment politically when the main objective is to beat the other side, right? Mm -hmm. And politics, that kind of politics, is a zero-sum contest for power. Only one person can be president. Only one person can hold a given House seat. Only one person can be in the majority in the state Senate. But policy isn't like that. You can say, what do conservatives care about? What do progressives care about? They care about different things, but you can often come up with ideas that, that synthesize those goals. And a lot of this book is about that. Uh, but, you know, I, I end on that theme of the moonshot, right, which is it's both about a big scientific goal, an engineering goal, an exploration. It's also about showing the Soviet Union that, like, 
we're the best, right? It was embarrassing to America that Sputnik got up there before us. It was embarrassing that Yuri Gagarin was up there in the sky. So we're going to show them, right? And did we accomplish anything? Like on one level, no, right? It turns out there's nothing on the moon of value. Uh, but what JFK said about that was true, right? I, you know, organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, right? It was a tremendous uh, stimulus to science and engineering in the United States to work on this problem because we thought based on our abstract scientific understanding that it was possible to go to the moon, but we didn't know how to do it, right? And by setting such an ambitious goal, putting a big budget behind it, we figured it out and we developed a lot of useful technologies along that kind of way. Whereas if you sit around being comfortable, you know, everybody's working on, I don't know, you know, selling a better widget, trying to, you know, get people to like click more on websites. Like that's not, that's not useful. That doesn't bring out the best in us. So 1 billion Americans, it's both the specific policy prescription, but it's also about the idea that having big ambitious national goals would be useful. Let's take this to a personal level. Um, and we could relate this to your career or not, uh, because I want to make it applicable for me as well mm -hmm. as the, the viewer and listener. And in, in, in we've heard of like BHAGs, the big, hairy, audacious goals and from the business books that are, that are out there and, and the merit behind them. For at, the, at the individual level, what do you think is an optimal goal-setting strategy in order to achieve some level of excellence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and sustain it? Yeah, I mean, you know, to me, it's about picking new goals, right? Mm -hmm. Trying things, hitting some points, going for them. And, you know, you try it out, you experiment. But like, you know, people, I, I do book interviews. People ask all the time, like, well, why did you write this book? You know, and you give your official answer, which is like, I was concerned about the blah, 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 blah. But another answer is like, I had just been doing the same old, same old for a little while. And, you know, an agent had talked to me maybe a year before I got back in touch with him. He was like, you should do another book. And I was like, no, uh, I don't know. You know, I did books before. Um, but like, I was in a funk, personally. Not that there was anything wrong with my job or my life, but I was just repeating myself. And I thought, you know, like, yeah, I should, I should do something. I should set some time aside and really think, like, what is the best book pitch I can come up with? And I'm going to make it something a little bit weird, you know? Mm -hmm. And if everybody says no, like, that's fine. I can come up with something else. But it turned out, like, there was some enthusiasm for my slightly weird book idea. And it was great. You know, it started to build momentum. The um, publisher, uh, Portfolio, who, who bought it, they, um, they set an incredibly aggressive uh, time schedule to get the book done by. And, you know, I thought, I was like, oh, maybe I should tell them I can't get it done that fast. But, you know, I thought to myself, it's like, well, what's the worst can, that can happen, right? Like, if I can't meet the deadline, I can't meet the deadline. But they want me to do it fast. I'll try to do it fast. And, you know, so I did, right? And, like, it's good. How, it's, how fast? Uh, it was probably, like, a nine-month uh, writing. From, like, zero to done? Or what was Yeah. The, yeah? Wow. Yeah, so it was, it was aggressive. You know, it was a, it was a fast sprint. Um, it's a different way of doing long-form writing than I think most people do. But I'm, I'm a pretty fast writer and always kind of have been. And, you know, it was energizing actually to have that kind of ambitious timeline uh, and, to, and to think in terms of like, look, I don't need to be afraid that people will laugh at this dumb title. You know, like the worst that can happen is they say, no, they don't want to bid, right? But it's, it's hard, at least for me, I think for a lot of people to put yourself out there psychologically. It's one of the as a writer, one of the toughest things is you know that to succeed, you have to differentiate yourself. You can't just be doing the same thing as anybody else. But the most psychologically comforting thing is to be just sort of in the pack with your peers, the same ideas, the same topics, stuff like that. And it's even just to challenge yourself to say, like, no. I'm going to be out there a little bit on an island. You know, people want to take shots at me. That's fine uh, because that's how you advance. I'll, I think that, that what you just said is true in not just writing and content creation, podcasting. I mean, there, there is that it's definitely the case. 
but it can be true in all careers and all aspects if you have kind of the 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 combination of guts willingness uh critical thinking skills because anyone can come up with like stupid outlandish things that don't make any (laughs) sense but i mean to, to have well thought out reasoned but unique and different ideas from the rest of the pack uh it takes a lot of work and so that's why i think those people are valuable can you share your philosophy on how you've been able to develop that skill to have a different perspective to say we should have 1 billion americans not mm-hmm. 350 million or wherever we're at how have you developed that skill to think in that way Sure. You know, look, I, I've been lucky in many respects in life. You know, I have um, writers and journalists in my family, so I've always been supported and like, this is something you want to do. Uh, you know, I, I I went to, you know, good schools. I, I've got some nice, nice stuff going on. Uh, but to me, it's... It's not even so much about developing the skill. It's about developing the courage, you mm. know, because you're never going to get anywhere with 100% ideas, right? Of course, you hope everything succeeds, but realistically, it doesn't, you know? Um, Even good ideas are sometimes not quite good enough or you don't quite execute them right. And, you know, it's hard to get over that kind of fear of failure. I think a lot of people experience it, right? If you really go for it, then you can embarrass yourself publicly. You can embarrass yourself privately. You know, because it's hard to succeed unless you really put your heart into something. Um, And then it hurts if it doesn't work out, right? And you have to be almost vulnerable in a in a certain sense, right? And and open yourself up to that while also being, you know, courageous, right? That like you're gonna go there, you're gonna try it. Because whether you're talking about writing or any kind of business, right? A lot of ideas, there's nothing wrong with the idea, but it's too obvious. It's like everybody knows it, right? So it's like there's 50 people doing the same thing. And it's hard to succeed that way, not because the idea is flawed, but because there's too much competition, right? You've got to do something different. You've got to do something unique. But that means like there's going to be doubters, there's going to be skeptics, and there's going to be a real possibility of failure. But I think when you, you know, you hear from anybody, I mean, there's a lot of people more successful than me, uh, people making billions of dollars with their companies and things. And there's always some moment when everybody was like, that's incredibly stupid. You're going to sell books on the internet? You know, like, come on, man. Right? And it's like, you have to push through that because if everybody thought it was a good idea, they would have done it already. Right? right? What, what are, is there a time or two you can think that it was just an epic failure for you? Like, wow, that <laughs> like from start to finish, that was just, and, and, and maybe some of the things you learned from it. Sure. Um, you know, th- we, we started Vox, right? And we had a, a lot of ideas. My, my Wait, can you, for the person, for the people yeah. who don't know, can you share a little bit about that 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 aspect of of what Vox is and 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 you and Ezra and your your co-founder starting it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so this is about six years ago now, uh, maybe going back seven years when we first started talking about it. But uh, I had been a writer at Slate, a sort of long time uh, blog guy, digital media person close friends with Ezra Klein, similar career trajectory. He was working at the Washington Post. He had a collaborator there, Melissa Bell, um, who was more of a a product person, but also a a real digital native, a professional. And so we wanted to start our own company and we had a lot of ideas. Um, Our sort of big idea though was, look, we're all still reporting to legacy media people, you know, But even though we're young, we have been doing this. We've been doing digital longer than anybody. So we should be in charge. Um, That idea, I think, worked out great. You know, like, Vox is good. We're doing good stuff. It's fine. We had a lot of specific ideas, though, about, like, how are we going to do things? And so many of those ideas were terrible. (laughs) Like, we thought we didn't need copy editors. Like, I don't know why we thought that, but like we were totally convinced and we launched with them and we would talk, people would be like, oh, shouldn't you make room in the budget for copy editors? We're like, fuck no, like we don't need, and it was just, it sucked. Like our, our website was, was garbage and everybody, um, 
was like embarrassed to be writing for it. And we had to totally turn tail. We had all kinds of organizational concepts internally that, you know, we were going to have peer editing pods and stuff like that. And it, it just, did, it didn't work. N none of it worked. Um, what did work was like, we had, you know, an editorial vision, right? About trying to do explanatory journalism, trying to give people context, uh, trying to do something with digital that wasn't just faster, faster, faster all the time. So like, that was good. But we also just like, we had a lot of arrogance and that arrogance led to a lot of unsound thinking. But fundamentally, without that arrogance, we never would have done it, mm -hmm. right? You need like that balance. You need to be self-critical, right? You need to be realistic. You need to be able to say, hey, this idea, like this isn't working. We, we need to abandon it. But you need to have the self-confidence to go forward, you know, because so, you know, I don't know what it is, but say we tried 20 things and only seven of them were good ideas. So one way of looking at it is, well, seven out of 20, like that's a terrible batting average. Another way of looking at it is, well, if you try to never fail, you'd have zero out of 20. You'd have zero out of zero, right? It's like, you gotta go do something. And, you know, so it's a successful company. Uh, we had other ideas that were terrible, like that me and Ezra should be uh, high level managers because uh, we were good writers. And like, that was a bad idea. We did it for a little while. We've got other people, Lauren Williams, our editor in chief, Allison Rocky, our executive editor. They're doing great. They're like early hires we had. We were, I think, good judges of people, but maybe bad judges of ourselves, but honest, right? Like being honest in your self-assessments is absolutely critical because you don't want to double down on failure, but you don't want to be afraid to try things. You mentioned that you and Ezra would not uh, tried it, but we're not the, the, the most optimal people managers. Uh, there's a lot of people listening who are in roles like that. I'm, I'm, uh, it's my particular area of interest based on my career. What, when, what was it about yourselves that you realized, oh, this, we need to focus on writing or being creative or podcasting or video? Like, what, what was it that you, when you realized that that just because you were good at one skill certainly didn't mean you were good at managing a team of people to do that? I won't try to speak for Ezra. You okay. know, he can, he can talk for himself. Uh, but I'll say for me, right, there is a level of calmness. Mm -hmm. that I think management requires. Uh, you need to be able to be there in the middle of a chaotic situation where stuff is flying at you and you have to make decisions in real time and you have to make good decisions, but you also like, you really can't let them see you sweat, I think, to be an mm -hmm. effective manager. You know what I mean? You need to be a steadying presence in the room. And I am a little bit too much of a flighty creative type. You know, <laughs> I, think, I think I did some stuff in management that was good, that was effective, but I am, I do What were you not, good at? You know, I, I think I did some good hiring stuff. I think, you know, I think I was a pretty good judge of people and, and, and stuff like that. But the sort of, steadiness under fire that really effective leaders have is not for me. And it's a little bit, it's interesting because in media, right, um, it's a real countervailing value because as a creator, right, as a public persona, uh, you want to be someone who's a little bit excitable, right? It's just like, it's better to be somebody who can get worked up about things, you know, who can get people excited about things, who can get people afraid of things, who can have that kind of connection and, and like ride the waves. And it's, I think, very antithetical to how the most effective managers do things, which is like, oh yeah, there's a global pandemic. Our offices are all shut down. The advertising market has collapsed, but it's fine. I got this in hand, you know? Like that's, and like our, our CEO is great at that. Our editor in chief is great at that. They have this incredible um, steadiness that is not my personality. And I think, you know, who knows? You know, people get like management coaches, like maybe there's ways to get better at these things. But I, I also, I like to write. So I, I had the privilege of being able to say like, this is this is not for me. Well, one of the one of the key elements that you mentioned that you seem to have developed a skill for 
is I, I think effective managers are talent scouts, mm. meaning they uh, have found a way to create some sort of magnetism to where talent wants to come to them, wants to work with them. And there's a variety of things we could get into as to how they, they, they create that magnetism. But they also then have a good, they're, they're good at picking. They're good at making the right choices when it comes to people. Because as my dad t- told me early in my career, you get the hiring part right, you will become rich and famous in this industry at this company. You get it wrong, poor, unemployed, out of here. It's the way it goes. <laughs> Sorry, bud. And 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 I always thought of that, and it's and it's something that I thought this is a, a something we we need to focus on. You mentioned you seem to be a good talent scout. What are some of the things that you look for in people? Obviously, when if you're hiring writers, they got to be good writers. We get that. Mm-hmm. Those are the table stakes. But what are some things you look for when bringing people onto a team? You know, I think it's about a lot of it is about finding people who want the job for the right reasons. You know, that like, you got to compensate people appropriately uh, if you want to get good people into your job. But you're almost never looking for someone who's just looking for a check, right? Mm -hmm. You want somebody who understands what your team is all about, who wants to succeed, who has a vision of how success in the role you're hiring for is going to get them into their next role. Right, because you can't replace that kind of intrinsic motivation, mm-hmm. right? And you have to know, though, because people who are out there, like nobody's going to tell you in a job interview, like I don't really give a shit about this job. It's just you know, my 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 husband, uh, you know, was moving to the city for grad school, so I need something to do, right? And you gotta you, you gotta find it out, right? You gotta find people who who have it there. If you don't mind, I, I need to pivot things uh, back to my book always because otherwise the publishers will kill me. Uh, but this is like one of the big themes here, right? It's like uh, the United States has had tremendous success as a country over the years because we are such a haven for people uh, from around the world who want to be successful, right? If you are born in New Zealand and you want to run a giant company, like, you know, the United States of America is where you want to do that, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. Like New Zealand's great. You know, it's beautiful. They got sheep things like that. Um, But the United States, you know, because it's a big country and because other people have blazed those trails, right? So many people from around the world want to come here. They want to succeed here. It's obviously not the same as hiring for a corporate job, but it's not totally dissimilar. And so I have some sympathy for the conservative view that we should more selective about immigration to the United States, which right now a, a lot of immigration is just like uh, you're somebody's brother and you know, you're know you on the right visa list. Uh, but I have no sympathy at all for the idea that we should cut down on the number of foreigners who come here, right? To the extent that we can get better at the selection process, mm-hmm. then we should be getting even more people, right? And it's the exact same thing. You're building a team, you're trying to grow a company, right? You want to strike that balance because you want a lot more great people on your team. So if you're having trouble figuring out who the great people are, you may need to grow slowly. If you can really figure it out, right? If you think you can improve your selection technique, you add faster. And, and I do think like as a country, it's the same thing, right? If we can say, if you believe in something like the, the point system that's, uh, in Trump's proposal. If you think that's a good system, then like blow it up, right? Like let everybody who, who meets these criteria in terms of technical skills, English language ability, like let them come because America is a great place to succeed and America succeeds because people come here and you know, we should do it. You, as the title notes, 1 billion Americans, um, was was part of the title because it is a flashy number uh it's a round number w- why one billion americans <laughs> um i can give you a so a te- technical calculation one billion americans is if the united states grew as rapidly our population growth equaled canada's for the next 80 years we will have one billion americans by the end of the 21st century mm-hmm. um, also it's a round number 
you know, I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, it has a lot of appeal, though. It's, it's triple our current population, which is easy to remember. It means we would have the population density of France, which is a country a lot of Americans are familiar with, would be about half Germany. Uh, also, China's population is shrinking. So, like, we, we become number one, right? One billion Americans by the end of the century. Now, all that being said, it's a little bit of an arbitrary round number, and I'm not ashamed of that, right? Um, you know, we started off talking about JFK and the moon, and I think that's part of the point there, is that, like, to an extent, you need to set salient goals for yourself, right? It would not make me cry if we ended up with 870 million Americans or, you know, some other arbitrary number, uh, but it's good to set a goal, right? Uh, because that helps you think about what you're doing. Are we making, you know, infrastructure provisions that make sense? Are we changing housing policy in appropriate ways? Uh, you know, and the book aims to persuade you that one billion is achievable, more achievable than it sounds like, right? Um, it sounds, I think people first hear it, they're like, that sounds a little crazy. Or they ask me like, are you even serious about this? And if you read the book, like you'll see, I'm, I'm quite serious. Mm -hmm. And then going through the changes that it would take to make it possible, I think it's fun. You know, uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of boring books out there and I, I didn't want to write a boring book. Sure. One, one of the, the parts that I took particular interest in is when you talked about some of these mid-tier cities that are declining in, mm -hmm. in growth, because mm -hmm. I live in one of them, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, I live in Dayton, Ohio, home of the Wright brothers, and um, six, out of, six of the 10 cities in Ohio, I think uh, the big ones are, are, are going the wrong direction. What are some of the, like, let's say the mayor of Dayton and other mm -hmm. leaders said, Matthew, uh, we're going to hire you to help uh, as a, as a, we're going to, we want, we want to bring you into the room mm -hmm. to offer your ideas, your thoughts and opinions on how, and there's good things going on that I've, mm -hmm. I, I pay close attention in Dayton, despite some of the, the, the news that that's, that, that's saying there's not, but they say, we're going to bring you in to help us as an advisor. What are some of the, the first initial an initiatives and actions that you would want to put in place to help the city grow? So uh, this is really a key part of the book mm -hmm. is that I don't have a great answer to that question because I think unfortunately, you know, we were talking about competition, right? Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem that these kind of mid-sized uh, northern half of the country, you know, cold weather cities have is not that there's no good solution, right? to, you know, improve your infrastructure, give a tax break to a big company that comes in. It's that everybody knows those answers, right? Mm -hmm. You can read uh, Richard Florida's books, uh, but everybody else can read them, right? And if there's only so much growth to go around, and we know some of that growth is going to be hoovered up by the big coastal cities that have the kind of glitz and whatever, and some of that growth is going to be hoovered up by the Sunbelt cities. Some people are going to Nashville. Some people are going to Austin. Well, then you leave, you know, Dayton, right, and Cleveland, and Cincinnati, and Toledo, and Akron, and that's just Ohio. There's Grand Rapids. There's Buffalo. There's Indianapolis, right? And so it's, can all of these cities do what it takes to establish a kind of thriving urban environment in a context where the national population is flat? And I think they can't, right? Because we know the answers, right? You wanna be a place that's friendly to immigrants. You wanna be a place that has arts and cultural amenities so the smart people wanna live there. You wanna be a place that's friendly to business, right? It should be cheap and easy to get your permits, right? If you wanna do something that's, unless it's like, you know, you, you don't want like huge explosions, but it should be simple to like get an office set up, get your licenses, come on and do these things. Uh, but cities are struggling against each other and against the fundamentals. And we need changes at the national level to make it possible to facilitate these ideas. And, you know, that means bringing more people in from abroad, doing more to support people who want to have big families. Because one of the huge advantages that smaller cities have, right, is you can get some of what people like about city living, but 
lives much more affordable, right? But that's only re- that's most valuable to people with kids. I mean, everybody mm-hmm. likes affordability, but you know, when I was a uh, single 20 something. I mean, I didn't care. I'd lived in a shitty basement in DC because, you know, it's about going out. It's about going mm-hmm. out of the house. It's, it's when you have a family that it's like, okay, is your house nice? Like that's what really matters to you. Right. So creating a supportive national environment for that kind of thing ultimately helps, I think, disproportionately helps those kind of smaller cities. Got you. Um, you mentioned earlier about your family and some of the history, and, and I read that your dad, uh, screenwriter and novelist, so this mm-hmm. is like in your DNA to be a writer. <laughs> what did you learn from your dad as a screenwriter and novelist? You know, I mean, he really taught me to take writing seriously as a job, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, a lot of people get into this, and they don't like it's hard, I think. You, they don't know a lot of writers. You know, it's like you read things, you know, like, oh, da da da. But my whole life, um, like, I watched my father get up every morning, get dressed, drink his coffee, eat breakfast, and go to work. Now, that's not unusual. Lots of people have a dad like that. But my dad was a novelist, right? But it was the same. He wasn't, it wasn't just like some like weird hipster thing. Like it was a job. He had a certain number of words he got done every day. He came home at the end of the day and just treating it seriously, treating it like the most boring corporate job in the world, I think is actually really valuable, right? I mean, there's things I like about being a writer that's, you know, different or maybe a little laxer. Uh, I was able to work from home or work remotely even before the pandemic, had everybody doing that. But I think, you know, not enough people, I think too many people who get into this line of work don't take seriously the fact that just like any other line of work, like it's a line of work, you know, it's a pain in the ass. You got to get it done every day, whether you want to or not you know, what, whatever's going on. And that's ultimately how you can get through assignments. You can hit your deadlines. If you go on Twitter, you know, if you follow journalists, people are always making jokes about blowing their deadlines or, you know, things their editor is saying to them. And it's because writing, uh, it attracts chaotic personalities. Um, but like, that's not, not good, right? It's 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 a dysfunctional aspect of this field that people feel so open, like kidding around about that stuff. Like I take my deadlines very seriously. I think I, I think I missed one, uh, you know, a couple months ago, and I I felt really bad about it, uh, which I think actually not a lot of people in this industry do. Mm. Uh, but you know, it's it's just like anything else. It's like you know, like tying your shoes and brushing your hair. I mean, I don't have any hair, but you know when I did. (laughs) It's all like valuable stuff, you know, even if you're in a creative field. You mentioned earlier that this book, uh, One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger, that you set a really ambitious timeline, uh, nine months from, from nothing to, to finished book, which is, which is pretty wild. Um, what was your process for working so fast? How were you able to get it done so quickly? Like, I'm curious, like literally the day to day, what did it look like in a typical day while you were writing this book for you? Because I, I don't know exactly uh, how you work, but I have to imagine you still have a job in addition to writing a book. I so do. Like the jo- I don't think you have to take a sabbatical from your job to write, correct? No, I mean, I, I took a couple weeks, uh, but, but yeah, but not, I mean, not I, a year. I, yeah. no, no, no. I mean, it was mostly a nights and weekends thing. You know, mm-hmm. I, I skipped, I think, a whole NBA season. It was tragic. Uh, but, you know, you've got time in the day. So the biggest thing is to be organized, you know, mm-hmm. to think about, okay, what's the schedule here? How much do I need to get done each day? Um, and go do it, you know? And I was able, look, obviously, I, I don't want to lie to people. I, wh- one reason I was able to get this done quickly is I drew on a lot of reporting and research that I'd already done for mm-hmm. other kinds of pieces. That's what made it sort of viable as a project to execute. Uh, but it goes back to what I was just saying before. I mean, you know, writing, journalism, like these are these are creative fields, and I'm not 
at all the tidiest, most organized person in the world. But those kind of virtues, like they do apply even in creative fields. And it was stressful to me. It made me feel almost like itchy to be organized enough to get this done. It doesn't come that naturally to me, but like that's the push. Like I, I didn't want to miss the deadline. I didn't want this to slip into being a summer 2021 book. And, you know, so I just, I had to do it. And, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of nights, a lot of weekends, uh, some extra burden on my wife, of course. Uh, but, you know, you can do it. Uh, I assume your wife is Kate? Yes. You, you said it, for, for, for Kate, comma, my one in a billion, uh, the dedication of the, of the book. What, t- tell me more about that. Well, she's my wife and I love her very much. Um, and, you know, I want to dedicate the book to her. Uh, you know, what's interesting. A lot of people who I know in DC, uh, particularly in journalism, uh, date or marry other people in similar lines of work. Um, and Kate is not that. Uh, she, she used to work on campaigns and did things and um, she's a sort of a nonprofit administrator, does, does grant management stuff. Uh, but like, she likes to read a lot of fiction. She's not that into my hot takes. Uh, it's not like relentlessly following me on Twitter or involved in the same kind of, you know, beefs. And that's actually really nice. I like that after work. I mean, I sometimes want to talk about work as people do, but like when we talk, it's like, I don't know, we'll talk about movies or TV shows or, or other things and, and have different professional and personal lives, which I think is very normal in the real world, uh, but is not that normal among people who I know. I know a lot of like two writer couples and that sounds very stressful to me. I think it's always a little bit uh, it's useful to sort of like disconnect um, in that kind of way, but also to be able to think. It's like, you know, I know a person who is not intrinsically fascinated by this. Uh, can I make it interesting to somebody like that? You know, can I make them care? I'm not sure I did make her interested in this book, but, you know, doing my best. Well, but I, I have found, though, that that having a great partnership with somebody like that, that you build a life with, you build a family with, is beyond a secret weapon it, it is critical in, in, in this and it, i sense that you have that oh absolutely and it's such a good you know it's it's restorative and it's also motivating you know to know that you are building things with other people um and have that kind of human connection outside of work right um and it helps you sort of come back to it and attack problems in your professional life with a different kind of vigor and not just sort of ego, right? But a real desire to make things work and make everybody be happy. Uh, books are always stressful on spouses, though, I know, and I, I feel bad about it, but hopefully it'll, hopefully a lot of people will buy it, in which case it's all good for everyone. You've, you've built a following of about 470,000 people on Twitter alone. What, why, why do you think so many people uh, follow you on that platform? I have no idea, you know? I mean, why does anyone was there follow an, anyone? Was there an inflection point <laughs> along the way where it was like, all right, we got to follow, follow this guy? No, you know, I mean, it, it does, it is a kind of thing where, you know, the more people follow you, I mean, if your tweets are any good, it's like more people will retweet you and, you know, you, you can build and build and build. Uh, I've been on Twitter like forever uh, since, since it started almost, uh, you know, when you had to send text messages and it would bounce back. I was like one of those OG users. So <laughs> I have never um, known exactly like when it took off or, or why, um, you know, if, if those 470,000 people, if like, if half of them would buy the book, I'd be a huge bestseller. So I, mm-hmm. I, I, I hope it, I hope it converts off the tweets. Um, but I, I love Twitter. You know, a lot of people disparage it and obviously there are problems out there. Um, but I have learned from so many people out there, so many, uh, business leaders, academic experts, policy people share their wisdom and expertise uh, and share their dumb memes and weird jokes every day. And, and I think it's great. Well, I think it, it, it can be one of the greatest learning tools in the world if you use it right. And it can also be one of the greatest uh, relationship slash networking tools in the world if you use it right. I would imagine you've probably developed and met 
some fascinating people through the medium. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you if you look at the book, if you if you turn it around to the back, uh, you see I got a blurb from Mark Cuban from you know Shark Tank and the Dallas Mavericks, and I got a blurb from Paul Romers, Nobel Prize winning economist. Those are both people I've never met either of them in real life, uh, but I know them both through Twitter. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and so that's the kind of range of connections that you can make from you know famous billionaire people to important academics. And I don't know of any other tool that allows that right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways you can waste your time out there. I don't want to say I have never wasted my time out there, Uh, but it is really valuable in its way as a, as a way of making connections and a way of learning. Uh, Matthew, given, given your history and your experiences and the people, uh, as you just mentioned that you've met whether you've met them in person or uh, online i love studying excellence and sustaining excellence i'm curious from your perspective when you think about these wide variety of 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 people you know and study and and write about what have you found to be some of the commonalities among people who have sustained excellence over an extended period of time well so i think you know i think this is really along the lines of your show, but I think the biggest thing that people who sustain excellence do is they try to learn from other people, right? Our natural instinct as human beings is to make excuses for ourselves and find criticisms of others. And everybody is flawed. So if you want to find criticisms of other people, you can do it, right? Like you're a smart person, whoever you are out there, and there's nobody out there, right? Whether it's me, whether it's you, whether it's Bill Gates, who you can't find flaws with. But to succeed, it's better to look at people who have achieved things and try to understand what you can learn from them. What are they getting right? And then to try to be self-critical about yourself, right? Not what unfair things happen to you or what disadvantages did you have to overcome, but what mistakes did you make? Or even what, what things that you had good reason for believing would work out, but they didn't, right? And, and making that psychological flip to trying to see the positive in others and trying to be rigorous in your assessment of yourself, I think it just doesn't come that naturally to most people. But it's the way to learn, right? Not just be naive about others or say that they don't have flaws or bad things about them, but it's so easy to find what everyone else is doing wrong. What's harder is to try to understand what they're doing right. Why do you think that's an issue? I agree completely. Why do you think that's a a problem? Both the not being not being rigorous in the assessment of yourself, love that quote, I'm going to use that, as well as trying to just find the the flaws in others, because obviously everybody's got them. Why do you think that's the, 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 the mechanism which a lot of people view the world? You know, I don't know, right? I mean, yeah, I could tell you some just so story about, you know, we got a little hunter gatherer band out there and we're just competing for status and gossiping behind each other's backs. And, and maybe that's right. Um, it's just, You know, it's part of it, though, is because it's true, right? Everybody who's out there has had some advantages that you probably haven't had. You yourself have faced some problems that other people haven't had. Uh, You, if it was just wrong that like, oh, these other guys are making mistakes or they're doing things that aren't fair, it would be easy to cure yourself of it. But because it's true, right? Like there's a lot of problems in the world. There's like a lot of injustices. There's a lot of assholes who are getting ahead in life. It's very easy to just sort of fall into that groove of negativity, right? And it's, it's the problem is, it's like, it's not that constructive. Right now, you can ask yourself, right? I mean, I'm a journalist. I cover politics. Uh, Social change happens because people are critical. So, like, I don't want to say we have to be Pollyannas all the time. But are you actually creating change or are you just mouthing off, right? Because that's not constructive. Whereas learning is constructive, right? Finding what's admirable in other people can help you. Or... There's a, there's a way of making change on a social level, but a lot of just kind of bitching and moaning uh, doesn't, it doesn't do what you, what you want to tell yourself it's doing. 
Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Matthew. I really appreciate your um, thoughts, investment of time, um, and for writing this book, One Billion Americans, The Case for Thinking Bigger, because I think regardless of the, um, the specific goal here that you're writing about, I think this could make leaders better and the fact that it will maybe adjust how they, one, view the world, how they set goals, how they think um, in regards to their, their families, their businesses, to, uh, to hiring. I, I think it could impact in, in multiple ways outside of just the specific topic that you're talking about. And that's, you know, I, I think that's a mark of a good book. So I, I'm, I'm appreciative of you, one, for being here and two, for, uh, for writing it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my goal right now is for people to buy the book. So I hope they will do that. Me too. Yeah. Again, 1 billion Americans, the case for thinking bigger. Where would you send my viewers and listeners to learn more online? Um, we check me out on Twitter, Matt Iglesias up there um, and check out 1billionamericans.com. Uh, you can see all about the book there and you know my other podcasts and everything else. Perfect. Thanks again, Matthew. I certainly would love to continue uh, our dialogue as uh, we both progress, man. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man. Cool. Bye.